All right, everyone should have been notified that we are now recording and we will go ahead and share our screen. All right. So everyone should be seeing my screen with a copy of the PowerPoint or the slide deck that we'll be using today, starting from the top. And so today we'll just, um, again, reiterate the purpose of the three-year plan. We'll go over some timelines of activities. Um, we'll talk about the three-year plan guidance and template a little bit, and then we'll have a robust Q&A discussion. And so speaking of the purpose, um, as you all know, up until this point, the purpose of the three-year plan, it is on your screen at this time, but um, the overall purpose of the three-year plan is to um, plan, excuse me, to assess the current um, services provided to the region at this time, as well as um, take a strategic approach to plan for the next three years and making sure that the plan is a collaborative effort amongst all uh, members within the consortium um, to, again, um, provide ad adult education and workforce services to adults in the region. And when we think about the ed code associated with the three-year plan and its purpose, we're evaluating the need, the current levels and types of education and workforce services available for adults in the region, as well as assessing the funds available and taking actions to address educational needs and improve member effectiveness, as well as um, improvement of integration of services and transitions into post-secondary, as well as the workforce. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Neil. Oh, thanks, Veronica. Mm -hmm. So hello, everyone. Uh, I wanted to do a little bit of connecting the dots. There's a lot of things swirling in adult ed uh, lately. So I wanted to make sure everyone kind of knew what was coming up, what is kind of on the horizon, how it will impact you, why does this come up in the three-year planning discussion? So hopefully I'll tie some loose ends together. So as you know, um, the Legislative Analyst Office who represents and provides uh, information, direction, um, whatever else the legislature needs, they're kind of the eyes and ears of the legislature. So uh, a gentleman from the Legislative Anal Office, Analyst Office, Paul Steenhausen, has been going around the state asking questions about adult ed, uh, interviewing everyone from the state level down to the local level, uh, at the school sites, you name it. And so he's been looking at our data, he's been looking at hours of instruction, he's been looking at transition data, uh, he's been looking at enrollment, participant counts, all of those things that you're looking at as your three-year plan. And so we are seeing some interesting data as we prepared this information for LAO we have quite a considerable number of schools out there that are not offering much instruction. And we were using the 1819 data. So consider that is our kind of peak in our five-year cycle here. And things probably got a little worse in 1920. And then certainly we took a downturn in 2021 as, as you all know. So even using the 1819 data, we saw maybe on the bell curve about, I wanna say 20% of our schools, well over 25,000 per ADA, which is sounds very ridiculous, but um, that's maybe they didn't report their hours instruction, but we assume that at the consortia level, you know, things were happening and people were following what they should be doing, so maybe, it's an error on their part, or maybe that's just what's happening out there. But it does, you know, send some a little bit of a shockwave to the rest of us to say, oh, how could this happen? So you have those kind of things swirling around. And so at the same time, we've mandated some consortia level uh, targets, and we've mandated some 
um, member level targets. And I think we were already thinking about this before we did these drills um, for LAO and things like that. So it was just kind of coincidental, but a good timing. And so um, we anticipate the uh, LAO recommendations maybe to come out later next year, maybe in the springtime. Uh, I don't know if that's early spring or late spring, um, but then there could be some uh, sponsorship of these recommendations by the legislature. And so if you look at the timetable and I'll go through the timetable a little bit, these things could be affecting us maybe in 23, 24, or being implemented on the last year of that three-year plan, 24, 25. And so things that they've been looking at are like funding models. How do we fund our schools? Currently, you know, we have a funding goes to the consortia and then based on a predetermined amount from the beginning of this program in 15, 16, we have um, the allocation amounts. I think that's possibly going to change because uh, they're looking at hours of instruction, they're looking at performance. And so I think you're gonna see some type of change in the next two, three years. And so that's why this three-year plan becomes really important because right now you get that funding every year, you get no less than the prior year. So now is the time to shift and move your consortia, shift and move those agencies in your consortia towards the time when their funding is going to be based on, you know, hours of instruction, ADA, performance, those kind of things. So we do have kind of a two to three year head start on this, and we have the opportunity to put plans together to get us ready for you know, that moment when, when things change. Another piece of legislation that's coming through, it was attempted last year. Um, it didn't reach, um, didn't, I don't think it uh, made it through the legislature. It was pulled back at the last second, but the carryover bill. And so that, if that goes through this legislative session, that could go into effect maybe like, 22, 23, or 23, 24, depending on uh, when they, with the language of the bill. And so that would also change kind of the landscape of how um, agencies and consortia are, are carrying money over. There would be a limit. And this would also include consortia because uh, I think the initial bill was member focused, but there will also be, okay. Is my sound going out? I don't know. Veronica, can you check? Is my sound okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, when it seems like when you're moving, it's going oh. in and out because of your headpiece. Oh, sorry. Okay. No worries. Okay, I'll stay still. Um, <laughs> so uh, with the carryover bill, there's going to be language. Um, so the bill is not out yet, but the carryover bill will impact I think consortia level as well as member level. So if your consortia is carrying over money year to year, or you have a consortia with just one member or two members, uh, and there's no way to move that money around, I think there's gonna be language in the bill that allows the state to come in and move that money to uh, for other purposes, if you're not, or maybe give you less in the future years if you're not meeting the threshold. So all these things are gonna come into play over the next two to three years. So it's important in your three-year plan to be a little more focused on things like, um, you know, enrollment, participants, uh, instructional hours, and uh, of course, outcomes. And so, um, we wanted to connect those dots before um, we went into kind of showing you the uh, the timeline. Uh, let's see, I'll pause there because I did say a lot um, to see there, there's probably a few questions here and we're gonna have plenty of time for question and ounce answer today. So let's see. Yeah. Uh, Janae says, uh, what bill your sound is going in and out? So sorry about that. Um, 
I forget last year, somebody might know what the bill was last year. It was, I can't remember offhand, but it was McCarty. He introduced the bill. Then he had too many bills and he had to pull one back or some back. And so he pull, pulled the carryover bill back. But we're, we're hearing that it's going to be reintroduced. But um, we don't, at the state level, we don't get involved in that process. But if you're a CCA, CCAE or a CAIA member or an ACE member, they do get involved in that process. So if you are interested in legislative proposals like coming from LAO or carryover legislation, I would suggest you join you know, one of those organizations that actually dialogue with legislators. Um, okay, and then Ed said, can you repeat the years you predict carryover may apply? So if that bill is introduced this year in the, I guess this would be the 21-22 session, and then those bills get passed or signed by the governor as late as October of 2022, that would give us maybe quarter four of 2023, which would be uh, September 2023, which actually would be part of that 23-24 year. But it all depends on the language and, you know, the... Um, when, when it's implemented date in the bill, sometimes it's January 1st, sometimes it's the end of the fiscal year, but it's gonna take at least, you know, this year to go through the legislative cycle, and then you gotta give it time to be implemented, or if it's part of the fiscal structure, you've gotta wait till the end of that fiscal year. So there is some time, um, and then it just all depends on, you know, how complex it is, and how long it will take the state to implement those changes. Um, so let's see, I hope I answered Ed's question. Let's see, Wayne says, is there a recommended percentage of carryover? Well, the bill last year was 15%. And so I'm assuming that's gonna be the same language. I don't know what it would be if it's gonna be the same language for consortia that wasn't spelt out in the original bill, so stay tuned. And I think your CCAE or CAIA member would probably have better information than I would. And then Melissa says, can we get the full list of metrics you believe we will be measured on? So, so the ones that we've mandated, Melissa, are the, at the consortia level, we're looking at enrollment and we're looking at student barriers at the member level, we're mandating uh, the number of enrolled students that make it to the participant count, which is 12 hours or more of instruction. And then uh, we're also looking at percentage of funds spent as the other mandatory metrics, which ties into the carryover legislation that I was talking about. And then of course we have the 10 optional metrics um, as part of the three-year planning process. And any number of those probably will be, although I'm not privy to what legislative analyst office is looking at as far as performance, but I would bet that any number of those 10 might be rolled into checking performance. Because those 10, when we had CASAs and West Ed and the uh, CDE and the chancellor's office looking at those optional metrics, those seem to be the ones that we could all agree upon that the data was fairly sound and that we had data resources that we could use to uh, for planning purposes and target setting purposes. So you could look at those optional metrics as the short list. I'm not sure what LAO is going to you know, use, what that's gonna look like, uh, it's still being formulated and discussed, but uh, just a heads up on that. So hopefully I gave you a little bit of a better picture on that. And Emma says 1491, that sounds too close to Columbus, but I'll, I'll take it. Uh, Serena says, appreciate the focus on data-driven equity decisions. Okay, thank you. 
that's where we're going. Okay, John, you're right. AB 1491. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, let's see, and then Eileen. At the beginning of the implementation of AG, ABG, AEBG, weren't consortium encouraged to have at least 40% as carryover each year? I don't recall that at the state level. That could have been a local decision, but at the state level, we always encourage you to spend down your, your funding. So um, Todd asks, besides the funding connection to outcomes, have you heard anything about the consortium model being changed as well? Haven't really heard anything about that. Although, you know, when I look at that data that we gave the legislature, and I saw all these high cost um, agencies, you know, with 40,000 per ADA, 25,000 ADA, and they just weren't doing any instruction. And this is back in 1819. I was wondering what, what, what was the consortia doing? Were they looking at the performance of that agency? And maybe, maybe the state's expectation was a little bit of an overreach to think that the consortia could take on that responsibility, but it did kind of catch us a little flat-footed. Uh, we were surprised about that. Um, so I don't know if the, Todd, I don't know if the consortium model is gonna be changed as well. Um, I don't, I didn't get that indication, but um, we'll see what the uh, policy recommendations are going to be. And they're still being formulated. So you still have a chance to, you know, reach out to the legislative analyst office and provide input. Um, as he mentioned, I think he was on a couple of webinars around the state and gave out his contact information. I don't have that with me right now, but um, I would encourage you to reach out if you get a chance. Okay, and then Wendy, given, whoop, too many questions here. Let's see if I can make this a little bigger. Okay. Hold on one second. Uh, given the public that public education is already underfunded, why is this austerity move? It sounds like no child left behind. I don't know if it's a. Uh, I think the legislature wants to be a little more focused. I'm not sure we'll get probably the intent and their purpose for doing this. Um, you know, and kind of changing the model a little bit. And then the uh, carryover legislation is something on a separate track. So um, we'll see how that goes. Kathy Walker, the 40% carryover came from the recommended percentages to spend each quarter in Nova. Oh, that's right. Sorry, Eulene. And thank you for reminding me, Kathy. So yeah, we originally in Nova, we recommended the targets being, you know, first quarter 15%, uh, second quarter 30%, third quarter 45, and then by you got to the fourth quarter, it would be at 60%, allowing you to uh, move 40% over. So yeah, maybe we did kind of uh, train everybody to have that carryover. So. Now we're just giving you a heads up that, you know, maybe uh, the time has come for that change. And that's why the legislation is going forward because how can we ask for more money when we're carrying over so much? So we'll see how that goes. And thank you, Kathy, for reminding me where that came from. Um, let's see, uh, consortium is plural, consortia. Oh, this is from Steve, yeah. I usually say consortia as plural and consortium single, but maybe yeah. my, my speech pattern, yes. Your um, volume is going up and down again. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me, um, let me go to my audio and see if I can change my, um, let's see, microphone. I think Veronica's right. I think it's just when you're moving your head. Okay. Well, it hasn't been like that before. I don't know. It's weird. Okay. I will try not to move my head. All right. So, uh, 
Emma says it's all spelt out in the fiscal guidance mandate. Yeah, we'll have to update these things. Like I said, two years out, three years out. Uh, Ilsa says, is the LAO looking into leverage funding and how those streams are used in support of the three-year plan and goals? Um, I think they're aware of that information, but they specifically asked for things like hours of instruction. So I think they're okay with how we're leveraging funds. They just want to have maybe a, um, I don't know, there's been discussion about a level playing field. So if you look at, look at the way the adult education is built, we have a community college non-credit program that has their own uh, funding stream, which is full-time equivalency, FTES, which is uh, the same as average daily attendance on the K-12 side. And so that doesn't go through the consortia, that goes through a separate track, and that goes to the colleges. Now, the K-12 adult schools do not have an ADA uh, mechanism. And therefore, all the funding for adult ed goes through the consortia. And so I think people have realized, is that really fair that the colleges get their funding without any consortia oversight or discussion, while the K-12 has to go through, you know, the consortia funding uh, process, shouldn't they get their own funding just like the colleges do on a separate track? So. I think that's been something that has caused some um, issues. And so maybe they're looking for a level playing field. And so maybe that's the issue that they're trying to deal with. And it's not really Elsa looking at the uh, all the other funds that we bring in. Um, and so what we'd be looking at leverage funding is, okay, here's the ADA for the K-12, here's the FTS for the colleges, Here's strong workforce, here's we owe it to, and then here's the CAPE consortia funding. But so I don't know what that's gonna look like, but I think we're going to see some changes um, coming as a result of that. And then um, let's see. So Yulene says, yes, we are encouraged to be a year behind in spending. So is this going to change? Um, so we shall see. And I think that's the last, comment or question, right? Veronica, am I all caught up? Yeah, Wendy just said um, that we are chronically underfunded educationists. Right, yeah, it's kind of a paradox, right? We're underfunded, but yet, you know, we're asking for more money, but then they point to the carryover as, well, you have plenty of funding, you're just not spending it. Uh, and then we have the pandemic and they're saying, well, what are you doing with this money? We gave you more money and now we're seeing your enrollment go down, but that's that's all over in all levels of education. So this is a real different era we're in. So um, don't have the crystal ball of how it's gonna turn out, but we'll be looking for those policy recommendations um, in the spring. And then who are on the LAO is the legislative, it's the legislative analyst office and the, the lead principal is Paul Steenhausen. So, okay, so let's go to the next slide. So here's the timeline for three-year planning uh, as of today. And so I've put in some other things that are kind of critical in the three-year time timeline. So in January, about maybe a month from now, we will get the governor's budget release for 22-23. And then once we get that release, the state will process the CAPE preliminary allocations for 22-23. And we'll put that in the NOVA system. And once we put that in the NOVA system, then you will have access to your three-year plan um, via NOVA. And that's kind of why we couldn't do the um, live demo today because it is contingent upon us opening it up by putting in those preliminary allocations. So we're gonna be talking to the NOVA programmers to make sure that we get those allocations input as soon as possible, or we can get access to a live 
a three-year plan so we can show you, you know, all the drop downs and how it functions. Um, but we're hoping to to know later than sometime in February get you access into the live um, three-year plan in Nova. Another thing to remember that if once you go and input your three-year plan into Nova, you can't certify it until your CFAD, which is your uh, funding certification, is completed by your consortia and certified by all members. And that's due May 2nd. So the earliest you could get it in is soon after your CFAD certification. So if you wanted to do an early CFAD certification, you could do that. And then that would unlock your uh, three-year plan to be certified as well by all your members. So you could do it at the same time or concurrently. Um, also, um, as you know, the three-year plans do towards the end of June, and then we have the annual plan based on that three-year plan. The first year of the three-year plan, that annual plan will be due the middle of August. So hopefully that makes sense uh, of kind of where we put these things in. Now, if you look at, you know, if the LAO releases their policy recommendations in the spring, maybe sometime between February and May, um, then, you know, we'll see where that goes. Will there be legislative sponsorship? What does that look like? And so I don't, I'm not sure if they could turn something around that quickly to get something in for the 22, 23 year. Maybe it'll be for the 23, 24 year. I would imagine there'd have to be some dialogue and discussion based on the LAO policy recommendations. Um, and so I could see that going into the 23, 24 year, possibly if there's some legislative um, or proposed legislation or something like that. But I mean, that's just my opinion and my crystal ball. Um, things could change, things could speed up, things could slow down, but that's kind of what we're hearing. So um, I'll pause there to see if there's any more questions before I turn it over to Veronica and she was gonna share a couple of things. I don't see any other additional questions. Yeah, that's correct. No additional questions at this time. Okay. Do you oh, want to take time. the? Yeah, I'll. I'll uh, if you want to move on to the next slide, let me see. Uh, Janae says, once those recommendations go out, will we need to revise our three-year plan to reflect them? So I would just be cautious because they're just recommendations. They have to go through kind of a policy discussion process and. And then the legislation, if there is legislation proposed, or maybe it'll be something put in the next year's budget bill or something like that, but there has to be some dialogue. So um, it's a long drawn out process. You know, it starts with recommendations and could go any different number of directions. So Janae, you just have to, you know, maybe rely on um, Cape Tap or the state CAPE office, or at the local level, CCAE, or um, CAIA, or on the community college side, ACE, to keep you informed of the progress that's going on um, with these recommendations. And then Kim asks, do we have a date for the February PD live demo? Not yet. We're trying to confirm with the NOVA programmers uh, when we will have access, and if we can have access earlier before the um, allocations are posted. So a couple of moving parts there, Kim, that uh, I can't give you a definite date just yet, but we'll know soon. Um, like those key milestones are the governor's budget. We'll see how much money we're going to get for 22-23, and then we'll check in with the NOVA programmers to see um, if we can have live access without the, the allocations, if we can, then that webinar will be scheduled sooner. If um, we can't, then we've got to expedite the process of figuring out how much each consortia gets for 22-23, post that in NOVA, and then that will unlock 
the ability to look at the um, three-year planning process. Okay, I'll pause there uh, and I'll turn it over to Veronica and I'll try to continue answering questions in the chat. Okay, great. Thank you, Neil. So um, on this, oops, on this slide, um, there are just a few PD opportunities that we have coming up. Um, so the um, by the end of next week, probably this week, but we have just solidified dates for three-year plan PLCs that we will be launching in uh, January, towards the end of January. And so we'll have monthly PLCs between um, January and March. And so with the um, announcement of the PLCs will also include a link to a Google form where consortia will be able to identify specific questions that they would like to potentially be discussed during these PLCs. They will be um, topic uh, focused and we'll start out with rounds of questions um, to get the conversation going and then whatever comes up during those sessions we will address at that time. But that's um, our next round of PD opportunities that we will we will have so that you all can continue the content specific discussions around the three year plan. And as Neil mentioned, we'll have the live demo of the three year plan um, sometime in February, if not sooner. So um, in the email that you receive right before today's webinar, all who registered to attend today's webinar for the live demo in um, Nova, your registration will automatically roll over to whenever we set the date. So hopefully we'll get some clarification on that and be able to schedule that webinar and then host it in the beginning parts of the new year. And um, that's all we have scheduled at this time, but if there are other areas that you feel should be um, trained on, if we should have webinars on, et cetera, then um, we can explore those opportunities. But we felt the next round would be just to have those PLCs where you all can come together and discuss the three-year plan in more detail around specific questions. All right, and then um, in just one moment, we'll post the three-year plan guidance as well as a template if you need access to that. Um, and we'll also be um, updating both. And so once we update both, we will send out the new guidance. Nothing substantive will change, just minor edits um, to verbiage as well as to links. But other than that, um, what you have now is in essence, the, the three-year plan guidance and templates. So you don't have to worry about if you've already started working on your three-year plan, something substantive um, changing, because that will not be the case. All right, and Veronica, um, I just might add that, you know, we're still trying to, uh, meaning the state uh, CAPE office and CAPE TAP, still trying to get a better feel of the NOVA system for the three-year plan. So once we get that um, hands-on ability and feel comfortable with that, then we'll start scheduling that live demo so we can you know, pass our knowledge and comfort level to you so you can you know, start working in the Nova system and you know, updating. So things like checking the links, checking to see what's auto-populated, where that data comes from, what does that mean so we can answer your questions and provide that technical assistance for you as, as you go through this process? So bear with us as we um, get up to speed on that. Okay, question from Kathy. Is the current governance plan going to be updated or will it be a new template? And so, Kathy, what's going to happen is they're going to take the current governance template and put it online in Nova. So you won't have a uploaded document or a standalone document. What you'll have are the questions that were in the governance document with the text box and you'll, or it could be a checkbox and you'll be responding to each of those questions. I think there's going to be just two additional questions to the governance document um, from the original one that was put on, I think, in 1516. And so, um, so it'll be a, let's see, it'll be an online version. And it'll have the same questions except for two additional questions. 
if that I don't know if that helps answer your question. So it will be updated and it will be in a new online version. Okay, thank you. So I don't know if anybody else has questions. Okay, so Ed, oh, okay. Ed is responding to Guillermo, but I'll, I'll read it because it's probably good discussion. Uh, Ed said, Guillermo, uh, move, move forward with creating consortia bylaws and include an approval process for capital outlay and large purchases, require long-term planning and carry over transparency and approval works. So good advice from Ed. Um, Ilsa says, for a regional service provider table when adding non-CAPE funded agencies, do we enter the number of participants or just programs? So what, and that's one of the areas that we wanted to get a better look and feel at. And so our vision for that regional service provider table was that they would bring in and pre-populate the existing services that each member provides with those participant counts. And those would be members. Now, if you had a non cape funded agency like Elsa's asking, you would just do a checkbox. You don't have to put in the um, participant counts or the, uh, so you just check. So let's say you had a non cape member or non cape agency, a partner that offered CTE and say adults with disability, you would just check those boxes. So, and we're gonna test that to see if that works fairly easily. Yeah, we understood that the numbers would get problematic. So check boxes are good to acknowledge that they offer the program, that they are a partner, and there are part of the uh, kind of service provider table, but we don't want to split hairs with number counts and stuff like that, because it does get sensitive since we're not giving them funding. Um, anyway, but we're probably leveraging funds with them, as you said. Any other questions? I mean, if you want, you can unmute and ask a question, right, Veronica? I mean, we're open to any mode median for di dialogue today. Right, yes, anyone can um, unmute. Uh, Sherry asks, just curious, is the LAA office using launch board to assess enrollment data? So thank you for asking that question, Sherry. So what we gave uh, the Legislative Analyst Office, although they had access to Launch Board, they also asked us for instructional hours from TOPSPRO. And so they have both uh, hours of instruction for eight, from the 1819 program year from TOPSPRO. They also have the 1819 data from Launch Board um, and I don't know if they're dabbling in data mark for community college uh, data, but they have access to that as well. So they do have various uh, data sources that they're looking at. Um, and we've done some number crunching for them using the TOPS Pro data. And so uh, Launch Board isn't the only data source. In fact, they're relying a lot on the TOPS Pro um, hours of instruction. You're welcome. And Wendy, yes, Wendy, I agree. The data mark data for non-credit in community college is totally messed up. Yes, there is a, since we've gone to a remote instruction, you know, since the pandemic, there has been a little problem with, um, accurately reporting those instructional hours through the um, chancellor's office MIS that they're working to fix. And so we'll see um, what that fix looks like. But right now, it, you're right, it's a 
the data is a little bit unreliable right now for those um, pandemic years until they fix that remote instruction issue. So it's always good to have those other data sources. And like Veronica said, we, we will do some minor editing. Uh, a couple of people caught some um, errors where we put uh, the wrong years in, I think the metric section of the guidance. And there's a couple of adjustments we have to do as far as um, when we understand what data gets pre-populated. Um, I think it wasn't clear in the metric section that the 10 optional metrics are truly optional and that the uh, consortia metrics, the two are mandatory as well as the member metrics, the two are mandatory. Um, and then Wendy clarifies on the uh, data mart issue needs to be fixed how asynchronous and synchronous instruction is captured in providing conflicting guidance. Yes, I would agree. So does anybody have questions about the mandatory metrics? Um, I have a I have a question, Neil. This is Annabelle. Um, hi, go ahead. Hi, and I'm I'm sorry if this is obvious, but maybe um, I could use some clarification. So the difference between the consortia level metrics and the member metrics. So I get it at the consortia level metrics, let's say we're looking at enrollment, number of participants, we're looking at that across the consortia for every member. But at the member level, whatever of those areas, so we have to choose two and then others are optional. Are those, uh, the ones that we choose as optional, could those, do those need to be the same across the consortia? Or could one member say, hey, we want to look at this, and another member say, oh, we want to track this? Yeah, so the way it's going to be, so at the consortia level, the consortia has to roll up the numbers and, and project out targets for en pro, uh, uh, enrollment. And then they have to project out the number of students, I believe, that they'll be serving in at least one of the barrier, student barrier areas, they could select more. And then when you get down to the member level, so each member is mandated to project out how many students are gonna have over 12 hours of instruction. So that's the participant count. So how many students are going for a role to participant and what that will look at like over the next three years. So every member in your consortia has to do that. And then the other mandatory metric is they have to project out over the next three years, how much money they will spend each year. Um, and they can do a percentage of the allocation. So if they're gonna spend down their carryover and their allocation, it might be 125% or 150% um, or something like that. So they have to project that down. Then after that, it's optional they can select up to 10 optional metrics and they can select whatever one they want. So you could have, you know, like two of your members select this specific uh, optional metric and you could have four other members select different optional metrics. So they don't have to be all the same. They can have some variation there at the optional level. Does that help uh, clarify that? It does tremendously. Thank you. So okay. it, can be, it can be different depending on maybe there's an area that a certain member wants to work on, which maybe is slightly different than another member. Um, right. Yeah. So some, some members might want to focus on uh, getting more educational functioning level gains. And then some other members might want to focus more on transition to post-secondary. And yeah, that's fine. That and that could be different, like those could look different between like an adult school and a community college. If a community college is not using EFLs, they may want to look at transitions from- Right, the, and, the and in, and an in some cases, um, we have some members that maybe don't offer instruction. They might offer services like services. Transition, transition specialist, 
counseling. And so they would have to look at metrics that could show their value of maybe they're helping students enroll or transition. And so they'd have to see which metrics would uh, connect with the work that they're doing. That they're doing. Thank you. That, that That's actually really helpful. Can I circle back to the, you're talking about targets for enroll, enrollment, back to the consortia level. So uh -huh. part of that collective consortia conversation is to set um, targets for enrollment. And I know that was touched on briefly last week in the webinar, but considering the way that enrollment has kind of been a roller coaster the last couple years, is there any guidance or best practice around how to set those targets? I would just agree upon a data source that the consortia wants to use. And then, you know, using that, um, you know, I guess going back, you know, historical data and then looking at, you know, pandemic years. And then as you get out of the, as we, we move out of the pandemic or hopefully move out of the pandemic, what you can project to see what it's going to look like. And it doesn't have to be, you know, it might be different than the launch board numbers. It could be different than the TE numbers. But as long as the consortia agrees upon the data source and they use it to project what they think is, um, you know, a reality mm -hmm. based on the current conditions, I don't think we're going to have a problem with that. But we would like to see some kind of goal setting happening and some targets set. And so you have that flexibility to use different data sources because so many things are in flux right now. And there are some problems, you know, with students coming back and data collection and this and that. And so um, it's kind of, you know, you still have to do that metric. It is mandatory, but how you come up with that data and how you project that is, is part of your process. And if that yeah, and so uh, different members might have different targets. So should we just project an average across the consortia? Oh, I see. So, I mean, you, you could good. do some kind of individual projection that adds up to a consortia level amount or something like that. There, maybe we'll get some best practices as people go through that that we could share. You know, yeah. how do they come up with that? Um, I know launch board totals at the consortia level, but I don't know if, you know, with the pandemic, if that, you know, historical data is really going to be helpful to project out since things are, you know, happening quickly or, or changing rapidly as compared to data from two years ago. Um, so we'll see if we can find some, identify some best practices. Uh, of how to do that. But I mean, you could simply just tally up um, everybody's targets and then you get your consortia level if you wanted to go in that direction. Great, thank you. Thanks so much for that. Okay. And then uh, Janae says, so the consortium mandatory metrics, do we need to choose metrics that all agencies can track? So on the consortium mandatory metrics, they're already chosen for you. So you have to do enrollment and you have to do student barriers. And then um, do we need to choose metrics that all agencies can track? So if you're choosing optional metrics for agencies to track, we are tracking all those optional metrics. So I don't know if I answered the question. Um, if you wanna put a, a, a clarifying comment on that, I'd be happy to answer the question. Um, so Joan says, so to clarify, only three of our six member are service providers. So only those three have to choose an optional metric. So Joan, so optional metrics are optional. So you don't have to choose anything if, you, if they don't want to choose, but they do have to do the mandatory. So each member, even if they're service providers, they'll somehow have to project out the number of participants and the percentage of funds spent. And so you'll have to figure out um, what those numbers will look like. Um, and I'm just trying to understand service providers. So 
Does that mean they don't provide any instructional hours, meaning they don't have any students reaching that 12 hour mark? I think I only saw a few in the state that didn't have instructional hours um, and some were more of a fiscal agent rather than a uh, instructional provider. So maybe a little clarification on that. Uh, Emma says, when setting targets in enrollment, how will the projections be entered as a percentage or per quarter or as an annual number? I think what we're doing is an annual number because that's how it shows up in, um, in launch board. And um, I think that would be helpful if we're all on the same page showing that annual amount. Because it is, if you look at the targets, it's by year. And so we'd want that annual number, if that's helpful. Okay, let me go down just a little bit here. Uh, how about an annual goal of stopping the pleading? Okay. <laughs> all right. Okay, and I think maybe I clarified Janae's question. All right. I don't know, Veronica, did I miss anybody? No, I haven't seen anyone to have missed. Um, Joan did follow up and say the other three members who are not service providers do not offer any classes or services and do not receive any funding. Oh, okay. So here's a good clarification. If they are not receiving any funding. Um, hmm. I don't know, Veronica, do you remember if they're not CAPE funded, do they really have to go through the mandatory member metrics? To the best of my knowledge, yes. They still have to if they're a member? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there, that might be something we wanna clarify is if they're not CAPE funded, does the NOVA system recognize them in the three-year planning process? Because I know it's tied to funding how the, uh, when you do your CFAD, the ones that certify are gonna be showing up in the CFAD, but I guess Veronica, do non-funded members certify the CFAD as well? They do. Okay. So I just wonder, so that's a good question. You know, we have a few minutes left. What do we do about those service providers that are non-CAPE funded, but are members? How would they fit into this three-year plan that we've set up, the structure? I don't know, Veronica, do you have any thoughts on that or we could open it up? I do not have any thoughts about that. <laughs> Put you on the spot. Um, that is interesting. It would be... Um, because it, it's kind of a round peg in a square hole because technically they don't have participants and they don't have funding. So those mandatory metrics wouldn't really apply to them. Um, and I don't know if the other services they provide would apply to the 10 optional metrics because you're not going to see uh, EFL gains. Are you going to see transition to employment or transition to post-secondary? Are you going to see immigrant integration? So maybe something we'll follow up on. That's interesting. I don't know, Veronica, if you can make a note of that, we'll we'll talk with the, the programmers about that. Okay. And then yeah. Joan. Um, Neil, this is Joan. No, <laughs> um, hi. Yeah, it, hi. It would be really helpful because I mean, our members, our non-service provider members, uh -huh. uh, give us give us support in the sense of they they represent a section of our community. We're in Sonoma County. Um, so, and they all happen to be K to 12 school districts. Right. Um, so though they are not given funding, they're not providing any kind of classes in adult education, they, some, they provide space. Right. Um, you know, to hold classes, um, but there, we're not charged any kind right. of, you know, rental fee. So, okay. so we collaborate with them in the sense that we're offering the adult ed classes in those areas. And they also help to tell us what the needs are for their parents, let's say. Right, right. So, 
Yeah, so let me that's how they're contributing. Let me take that back and see how we can do that justice in the three-year planning process or make sure we somehow give them an avenue to be a, a part of that three-year plan. So we'll get back to you on that. Thank you for bringing that forward, Joan. All right, thank you for, for answering. And I have to run to another meeting, so thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Happy holidays. All right, happy holidays. So Janae has a question of the four student barriers. Do we choose a barrier that all agencies can track? So it's at the consortia level, Janae. So yes, you could choose one or more. Um, and usually your attendance system or if your K-12 TOPS Pro will have that. I believe in the college system, they also track uh, student characteristics. Um, but you know, you're right, choose a barrier that all agencies can track. I know the state level systems are tracking that so you might want to just confirm that um, that that's those agencies are are collecting that data. I think they are. So John says non-funded members do not submit program area reports, right? So um, this is a little different with the CFAD because non-funded member non-funded members have to certify the CFAD, which also makes them part of this the three-year planning certification. So we're gonna to have to look at that. I don't think there's a lot, this is kind of a outlier, but we wanna make sure that, um, you know, we lift all boats with this process. So more to follow on that. And Yulene, yeah, it's optional in the program area reports, but with the um, three-year planning, all members have to be part of the certification process which would also include, and that's why we want to talk to the programmers, would that also include them as being part of the uh, member metric process of the mandatory metric? So um, we'll find out. It is a good question, right, Karima? <laughs> All right. And uh, John says, I recommend that unfunded members are part of a local decision-making process and may certify the final three-year plan, but they have no deliverables to deliver. Okay, that is a great recommendation, John. We will take that forward and see if that will fit into the uh, NOVA programming. And then Mitch adds, even previously funded members need to continue submitting reports in NOVA for a certain amount of time. Thank you. And Marianne says, agreed, no enrollment, no money, should not have metrics. John adds, unfund, John uh, Makovich uh, adds, unfunded members may contribute towards deliverables for the consortium though. Right, yeah, so, you know, like Joan was saying, they're offering their space to the uh, members that are providing the instruction. And so they are contributing, you know, in kind, um, to or the leverage funds, like Ilsa said earlier, that leverage funds is happening and they're part of that adult ed network in the region. So it does count towards the delivery of services. Uh, but look for, okay. Yes, Marissa, please look through the stuff. Send me, send us, send us Cape Tap any questions you might have. And uh, uh, Corinne, uh, Confer, concurs with John's statement. Um, we have a county office member, but they are not funded by our consortium and they don't have any program participants, right? Yeah, so we'll, we'll check that out. And let's see. And then John adds, we just have a few more. Unfunded members certainly contribute and are even beholden to the three-year plan as willing participants, but they don't generate any metrics. They do not enroll program participants, correct. I would agree, John. And then uh, last question here, Janae says, seeking further clarification are the, uh, I would say mandatory, not matador, but I like the term matador consortia. Uh, mandatory consortia and member metrics all tied to HOA, 
hours of instruction. So if one or more of our HEs spend their funds on support transitional service, do we include them in these metrics? So let's see, the enrollment is tied to hours of instruction, the student barriers, I mean, I guess you'd have to get at least one hour of instruction to be considered enrolled, so yeah. And then if you look at participant counts, that's tied to hours of instruction. The funding isn't tied to hours of instruction, but you're right. Um, those mandatory metrics are all tied into hours of instruction. So if you have one or more agencies that spend their funds on supportive services or transitional services, how do we include them in these metrics? So like they were saying, these members contribute to the overall efficiency and performance of the consortia. And so if they're providing transitional services, I would assume your transition numbers would be impacted by their services. If they're you know, transitioning students to uh, post-secondary or transitioning to employment, or if they're offering counseling, for students that may, might be going into CTE or you know, other program areas, you would think that there would be a relationship to the services they provide that translates to an increased uh, amount or some kind of relationship to that program or those uh, metrics that we're tracking in transition employment or transition to post-secondary. Um, or student progress in general uh, through some of the other metrics. So I'm going to stop there, and I hope I asked Janae's question. It is a little dicey, but you can connect those transitional services to how that's impacting those other metrics, depending on what services they're offering. Um, okay, so we'll use mostly transition numbers for that. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Veronica and Mandalee, do you guys want to wrap it up? Sorry that we couldn't give you the, the goods today, but uh, we look forward to dialoguing more in the new year. And we wish everybody uh, happy holidays and uh, good fortune for the new year, turning the leaf, uh, maybe better uh, student enrollment in the new year. We hope everybody getting back on track. We'll see, cross our fingers. Uh, I'll turn it over to Veronica. All right. Thank you, Neil. And thank you all very much for participating today. Although we had to shift direction, um, hopefully you all received answers to your questions and be on the lookout for further communication from us regarding those PLCs that will happen at the beginning of the year, as well as updates to the three-year plan guidance and template, and then the announcement of when we can actually do the live demo, plus other information. But until then, everyone definitely have um, a great break as well as happy holidays, and we will talk to everyone soon. Take care, everyone.